Do you know what we've done with sin? We've broke it into five categories. Drinking, smoking, fornicating, adultery, and murder. If I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't fornicate, I don't commit adultery, and I don't murder anybody, well, I'm a pretty good person then. Talk to people and ask them if they're a good person. They'll say, sure I am. Why? Well, I've never killed anybody.
Amen. Take me to the king. I love that song she sang this morning. Take me to the king. I'm weak, tired, fighting, but take me to the king. That's where our refuge is this morning. Amen. At the king's feet, at the cross, at the foot of the cross is where our refuge is this morning. And powerful song this morning. That that blessed my heart. If it didn't bless anybody's, it blessed mine. I want to thank her for that song this morning. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be reading this morning in Genesis. I know that's really hard to find. I'm going to give you all a minute to find that one. It's toward the back of the book, back of the Bible, right after Revelation. You'll find Genesis. Everybody got there. Okay, well, good. We're going to be reading in Genesis this morning. We're going to be talking about two brothers. If you came to our study Thursday night, we, we talked a little bit about them uh, uh, briefly um, as Pastor Ron was flying through Genesis. Uh, we're going to back up a little bit. And I want to talk about some things that I read this week that I've never really thought about before. I never really read until I begin to study. And the Bible tells us that we're to study to show ourselves approved. We're to study to know the Word. We're to study not not to be Bible scholars, not to be pastors or preachers, but to study to know who God is. Amen? To know what He's about. To know know who the God that we serve, the one that we follow, what, what does He say about us? What is He about? What does His character tell us in His Word? Because the Word is His Him speaking to us. Telling us about Him, showing, revealing Himself to us. So we're to know the Word. And we're going to start reading, and, uh, and usually I read through the Scripture, but I think I'm just going to dissect them this morning. I think we're going to uh, go verse by verse, and we're going to start in verse 3. Now I just want to give you a quick highlight. Abel and Cain were brothers. They were, the, they were the sons of Adam and Eve, and, and they, they, uh, the Bible tells us that Cain was a tiller of the ground, and that Abel was a, uh, a, a keeper of sheep. And these two brothers, the Bible says in verse 3 is where we're going to be starting. I want you to go with me in verse 3, and it says, In the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, verse 4, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offerings. Now I just want to stop there a minute and understand something. In verse 3 it tells us in the process of time. What does that mean? In the process of time it means that they were coming of age. They were coming to a point in their life where they now had to make a decision whether to follow God or not. You realize that your children, that those that have children this morning, as they grow, they will come to a point in their life where they themselves will have to decide whether they will follow God or not. And it's our job as, as parents to instill in them who God is, what He's about, what He's done for us, in the hope that they will make the choice to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. So here we have in the process of time that they have now come of age to decide if they will have a personal relationship with God or not. They have to now make the decision whether they're going to obey or not. So they bring these sacrifices unto the Lord. And understand that this was a different kind of offering or sacrifice. This wasn't, there was no law that was imputed yet. Now you know the law of Moses talks about that they had to bring a lamb and slaughter that lamb and the blood would be their covering. It wouldn't forgive their sin, but it would cover their sin until Christ came and ultimately could forgive sin. But they had brought an offering to God. That's why when you read, Cain brought fruit because he was a tiller of the ground. So that's what he would bring. His offering would be of what he grown, what he worked and took and produced with his hands as as God allowed him. And he brought fruit. And you know, I just want to point out something here is God was not so so much concerned with what they were bringing to him. He was actually more concerned in how they were bringing their offering to him. And you're going to see because see, In the process of making Jesus our Lord and Savior, we have, the Bible tells us, to deny ourselves to come to Him. Deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Him. Hence, where we got the crosswalk 
name from that scripture. But some people have a hard time denying themselves. See, even in the church, we have people who they want to follow God, but they want to follow God on their terms. They want to do it their way. And here you're going to see this in Cain and Abel is you have one that's going to come in mercy, seeking mercy, and one who will come doing it his way. So we're going to we're going to go through this. And I just want you to kind of see some things. But God was not so much concerned with what they were bringing. Abel brought the from his calves and uh, because or the sheep. And I keep saying calves. I don't know why I want him to bring a cow for some reason. But Abel brought of his sheep and Cain of his fruit. And here's what's interesting. I, I used to believe, I, I don't know why I believe this. I don't know if it, I don't want to blame any kind of teaching or, or anything like that. But I always thought that Cain held back on God here. I always thought maybe, maybe why, you know, why didn't God, and, and we're going to go in about his acceptance. But I always thought, you know, maybe Cain didn't bring his best to God. Maybe Abel brought his best, but I just want you to point, I want to point out something. If you read in the scripture, it says that Abel, verse 4, and Abel, he also brought of his firstlings of his flock. That means they both brought their best. They both brought the best of what they had to God. Cain brought the best fruit he had to God. Abel brought the best sheep he had to God. But listen what it says here in verse 4. I just want to point this out. And Abel, all, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock. But listen, and of the fat thereof. So he didn't just say, you know what, I'm not just going to get the best. I'm going to get the best and the biggest. I'm going to find the greatest one I have to bring unto God. And the Bible goes on to tell us that in verse 5, well, verse 4, into verse 4, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offerings, but unto Cain and to his offerings he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance Fail. Now, the word respect here is not the respect like we think of respect. The word respect here is more talking about that God accepted what Abel brought to him. That the sacrifice that Abel brought, God accepted it and said, I will take it. I'll accept it because Abel brought it by faith unto God. Abel brought his gift by faith. And the Bible says that the way God would accept it, now this is the study I have. If you find something different, I want you to show me. But from what I've researched, the way God would accept their offering and how you would know that, that God accepted their offering is that the Bible says that the fire would come down and consume it. Now, if you remember, it talks about that in Leviticus. But if you also fast forward, if you remember Elisha, Elijah he, uh, he brought the sacrifices, and, or he had made the, the altar and brought the sacrifice, and, and, the, and the, uh, uh, the, the servants of Baal were there, and they were calling on God to see which one would consume the sacrifice. And if you remember, the Bible says that the fire came down from heaven and, and consumed the sacrifice and even licked up the water. And that's how you knew that God was who he was, that he consumed. He accepted the sacrifice of Elijah. I often wondered, and I will tell you, I told Pastor on this morning, I often wondered, like, man, these guys could call fire from heaven. Can you imagine if you could just go in your prayer closet and just call down fire from heaven? Some of y'all would have your houses burn up. Would you not? I even think about the disciples. Listen to this. If you, if you read in Luke, some of you probably have never read this or never thought about this. Luke 9.54 the disciples, they were in Samaria or talking to some Samaritans. And you know how the Jews felt about the Samaritans and, and how they didn't like each other. And the Bible tells us that the disciples got upset and said, Jesus, do you want us to call the fire from heaven and consume up the Samaritans? And Jesus said, whoa, whoa, guys, you have, you're, you're coming with the wrong spirit. So I often wondered why, why the, we don't see that much anymore, the fire coming down on, from heaven. And let me tell you why. Because, again, I'll tell you the way God accepted the sacrifices was the fire coming and consuming it, right? Well, guess what? When Jesus was here, the ultimate sacrifice was here. The one that, that, that God looked at his son and said, this is my son in whom I am, am, am well pleased in. That was the ultimate sacrifice. He needed no other there is nothing that we can bring to God that he'll accept over what his son did for us. That was the ultimate sacrifice. That is what we put our faith and our hope in. It's not what we can bring to God, but what God has done for us. Because it's in that 
sacrifice that he was well pleased in what his son did. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus was obedient even unto death. That's the sacrifice that God was well pleased in. But here, we're going to see the difference here of, of Cain and Abel. How the Bible says in verse 5, God did not accept Cain's sacrifice. And I, and I believe that people around saw it. I believe people around there noticed that, hey, God didn't send the fire to accept Cain's sacrifice. Because the Bible says that he went angry and his countenance fell. That he was upset. People could see it on his face that he was angry. He was angry and, and obviously who was he angry at? God. That he didn't accept his sacrifice. Can you imagine Cain now in his thinking? He's probably thinking, Lord, or God, I just went out there and, and tilled that ground and and." Brought all these fruit up, and now I've brought you the best I have, and you don't want even want to take it? You don't want to accept what I've done? That's the kind of attitude, and, and we're going to go on, and I'm going to show you what Cain was about here as we go on. In verse 6, and the Lord said unto Cain, listen to this. The Lord said unto Cain, Cain, why art thou wroth? Why are you angry? And why is thy countenance fallen? Listen, verse 7. If thou doest well, shall thou not also, or shall thou not be accepted? He's saying, he's saying, hey, Cain, hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Listen, if you bring me your sacrifice or your offering with the right heart, with the desire of, of what the problem is, won't I accept you as well as I did your brother? Sure I will. Doesn't Jesus, when, 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 when the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believes him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You understand that that was for everyone. When he was reaching out on the cross, when he was stretched out, he was stretched out for everyone that would come unto him. And God was telling Cain the same way. He said, hey, if you go and make things right, you come back to me with the right spirit, the right heart. I'll accept you like I did your brother. But listen what he says. Oh, listen what he says. Verse 7. If thou doest well, shall thou not also, or shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, what happens? Sin lieth at the door. And listen to this. And unto thee shall be his desire. Now, what does that mean? Unto thee. The, the New King James, which is where I was reading, and I, I kind of like what it says a little better. It says that it's desire for you. Now, what's, whose desire? Sin. He's talking about sin here. He says, Cain, if you don't do well, sin is laying at the door waiting for you. As soon as you, as you, if you reject what I'm telling you and you go, sin is waiting for you. And its desire is to have you. But... But listen what he says at the end of verse 7. And, but he says, and thou shalt rule over him. So what he's saying here in the King, New King James is, 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 explains it this way. Sin is desirous to have you, but you shall rule over it. You don't have to go through that door, Cain. If you would just listen to me and be obedient, do what I'm telling you to do. The sin that's waiting for you behind that door, you don't have to go and partake of. You don't have to go and be a part of that sin. That sin doesn't have to be in bondage in your life because you shall rule over it. That's what God is telling Cain. But what does Cain do? What does Cain do? If you know the story, Cain goes on. The Bible says that his countenance fell. He was angry. He went away. And the Bible tells us in verse 8, Cain and he Begin to talk with his brother. And I believe he was angry at his brother. Jealousy began to rise up in him. Anger was rising up in him. All these things. And the Bible tells us that he went and killed his brother. He went and slew his brother. That sin had overtaken Cain. That he allowed himself to walk through the door of sin. Where God told him you don't have to go. But he went. And sin and Exactly what God told him would happen, happened. God told him that if you go, sin's desire is to have you, Cain. And if you go into that door, it's going to have you and you're going to sin. You're going to be in sin. You're going to be bound by sin. But he says, but it's not, that's not what I want. I want you to rule over it. But the offering that he brought to God, 
He brought it with the wrong heart. And he never went in repentance or to make things right with God. When God was giving him the ability, giving him the option to opt out and say, Cain, don't go that way. Don't do it. Sin is waiting for you. And if you go, you know, there's a, uh, there's a saying that I've heard, and I'm sure many of you have heard, but it, it goes something like this, that sin is, is, is uh, uh, there, it goes that sin will take you farther than you want to go, cost you more than you want to pay, and keep you longer than you want to stay. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever heard it takes you farther than you want to go? God was telling Cain, Cain, when you walk through that door of sin, that's waiting for you. If you open that door and you walk behind it, it's going to cost you more than you can pay. It's going to take you further out than you really want to go, Cain. And he's going, he said it's even going to keep you longer than you even want to stay. It's going to keep you, Cain. And he was telling him, don't do it. The Bible tells us in James 1.15, he says that sin, when it's birth and, you, and it has been committed, it says when sin is finished, it brings forth death. That's what the Bible tells us. We continue in sin, and sin will ultimately bring forth death. Now, I know some people are like, well, what do you mean by death? Well, it, it could mean a physical death. It could. It could mean a spiritual death. Cain suffered a spiritual death when he walked through that door. Many will say, well, but hold on, but he killed his brother. But you got to understand something. Cain had the option to go before God and receive repentance, and he refused it. He refused it. And we're going to go on. I'm going to show you. I'm going to back this up in the scripture because I want you to see something. I want you to understand that sin wants to rule in your life. Sin's desire. We don't talk enough about sin in the church anymore. I'm worried that you know what we've done in the church and, 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 and I'm not talking about specifically this church, but church in general. I'm worried that instead of talking about sin, we say, well, nobody's perfect. We've covered up sin with nobody's perfect. Right? Haven't we done that? Because you talk to anybody, unbeliever or believer, they'll quit. They'll be quick to tell you nobody's perfect. Nobody, well, I mean, you know, but you're doing this. Yeah, but, you know, nobody's perfect. Yeah, sure, I do this and do that, but hey, you know, we're all falling short of God's glory, right? No, none of us are perfect. Nobody, there was nobody perfect but Jesus. And that's true. That's true. None of, none of us are perfect, but the Bible gives us a different uh, outlook on sin in our life. There is a difference. Listen to me. Listen to me. There is a difference of sin in the life of a believer and sin in the life of the unbeliever. I'm going to tell you that because I'll tell you why. Sin in the life of the unbeliever rules that person. It, decide, it makes the decisions for him. It leads him in the direction it wants him to go. And ultimately, if, it, if that person continues to follow in sin and walk in sin, sin will lead him to where it wants him to be. That's why our prisons are full. That's why people are addicted on all kinds of things. Because they continued to follow the course of sin and it led them to a place that they didn't really want to go. And it's keeping them in a place that they really don't want to stay. And it's costed so much more than they can pay. So much more. Listen to me. Listen to me. We can't cover up sin and say, well, nobody's perfect. The problem is, is that people are living their life without the power of the Holy Spirit in them, working in them. Because ultimately, as a believer, we should be working, the power of the Holy Spirit should be working in the believer to rid them of sin, to fight against sin. Not that you'll ever come to a sinless perfection. Don't underestimate, don't, under, don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying you'll ever come to a place where you'll never sin and do right your whole life and you just live in this utopia and you'll be a perfect. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is in the life of the unbeliever, sin will direct them. In the life of the Christian, you will fight against sin. You will struggle against sin. You will fall against sin, but you will get back up and say, Lord, help me overcome this sin in my life. I continue to bring it back before you because even though I can't do it in myself, and let me tell you, the reason that the Holy Spirit is not working in some people is because it's not because they're, they're not good enough Christians. It's, not, it's because they're not born again. 
We got to be for real about it. We got to we got to we got to bring this to the forefront church. People that everybody that's in church is not a Christian. The power of the Holy Spirit is not working in them. It's not because they're not perfect. It's because they're not born again. Bible tells me is that when I'm born again, I'm a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. And when all things become new, instead of sin directing my steps, the Bible says that the Lord said, I'll direct your steps, because the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord, not by the sin that we commit. It's not directing us as the unbeliever. But when we realize we sin as a believer, we hate it. We come back to him for forgiveness. We come back seeking him, saying, Lord, help me. This is a problem in my life, and I need victory over it. Does it happen instantly? Maybe. Maybe not. It may be a battle. It may be a fight that you continue to take before the Lord. He continues to just sanctify you and and just give you a little bit more, make you a little bit stronger, a little bit stronger until you've overcome whatever it is that you've brought before him. But then guess what? That's the good news. You'll continue to overcome sin. The bad news is there'll be something else. And you'll have to take it before the Lord. And you'll have to wrestle. And you'll, even if you think of that story of Jacob, and I didn't even want to get off onto this, but if you think about Jacob, the Bible says that Jacob went and he wrestled with the Lord, and he, or he wrestled with the angel, and the angel said, let me go. And he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Have we ever went and wrestled God like that? Said, no, Lord, I ain't going anywhere until I overcome this sin in my life. I ain't going anywhere until this this, this discouragement I have goes away. I'm not going anywhere until this feelings of anxiety and depression and these things, they don't overtake me anymore. That's where we got to get to. That's where we we have to get to these places where a born-again person will wage war against sin, but they'll win. Because let me tell you, when Jesus took your sin on the cross... He did clean you and wipe your sin away. He did do that. But you know what else he did? He broke the power of sin in your life. You say, well, uh, what do you mean? That means that the Bible tells us that you, sin will no longer direct your life. Sin will no longer have you bound by things. Not that you won't struggle with it. Understand the difference. There's a difference in struggling and being bound. Complete difference. Paul tells us to fight, or actually Christ told us to fight against sin. He said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. If your hand offends you, cut it off. That he's, it's better to, to, to cut these things out of your life and go into heaven maimed than it is to, to be cast into hell with all your body. What is he saying? He's not literally telling us to cut things off of us. Because we'd all be in trouble. None of us in here could be able to see. We wouldn't be able to hold nothing. But Christ tells us, he says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. He's saying, I want you to fight against these things that you're struggling with. If there's things in your life that you know are wrong, because the Bible tells us that he who knows to do good and does not do it, it is sin. Thank you. One person knows. If you do things and you know it, you know to do good and you don't do it, it is sin to you. You know what blows my mind? Do you know what we've done with sin? We have broke it into five categories. We have. I'm going to tell you what they are. Drinking, smoking, fornicating, adultery, and murder. Drinking, smoking, fornicating, adultery, and murder. I want you to understand, we have broke sin into these five categories, and we measure ourselves by these. If I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't fornicate, I don't commit adultery, and I don't murder anybody, well, I'm a pretty good person then. That's what we've done. Talk to people. Y'all haven't talked to enough people. Go talk to people and ask them if they're a good person. If they think they're a good person, they'll say, and you said, they'll say, sure they are, sure I am. Why? Well, I've never killed anybody. That's what they say. That is what y'all think I'm joking. I'm telling you, we're gonna we're gonna take a field trip and go through Andrew and ask everybody in Andrew if they think they're a good person. And I guarantee you, most of them will tell you, sure I am. I'm not a bad person. Nobody's perfect. Then I've never really killed anybody. That's what they're going to say, because that's what we associate sin with, those things. But Paul says, Paul tells us to bring your body into subjection in all your members. Because here's the thing, church, if we don't begin to train ourselves to fight against sin and bring our bodies into subjection, 
our eyes are going to wonder to everything that twinkles. Everything that twinkles, our eyes will be looked to it. Our hands are going to reach for everything that's evil. Our ears are going to listen to what the world says and not God. Our mouth will speak death. As the word says that the power of the tongue, there's life and death in the power of the tongue. And our feet will be quick to run with the world and walk away from God. We have to bring, how do we bring our lives, our members, Paul tells us, into subjection? Well, it takes training. I told you about studying the word and showing yourself approved. You know, if you look at uh, athletes, I have met the most young people who think that these big athletes who have trained their whole life to be where they're at, that young people have this mindset that they can just obtain it with doing nothing. That one day they're going to wake up and be LeBron James. One day, they're going to wake up and be Muhammad Ali or, or all these big stars or some old stars. But let me tell you something. I like UFC. Does anybody here like UFC? Anybody watch UFC? I like UFC. I know some of you. I know it's sin to some of y'all. But I like UFC. And it's, it is, it's fighting where two men get in this, this octagon and they fight each other. But let me tell you something. These men don't go into this fight without proper training. They don't go into the fight without studying their opponent and training on how they'll overcome that opponent. Think about that. Think about that. We're all going to leave here today and become UFC fighters because today I'm telling you how to become one. Because you have an enemy. And you, with the word, have to train on how to defeat your enemy. Think about it. Think about it, church. You're not, if you go into a fight... Without the proper training, the devil is going to wipe you out. He's going to wipe you out. If you don't go with the proper training, well, what is that training? Does that mean I have to memorize the Bible? Yes, you've got to memorize Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Exodus. If you don't memorize them, you're in trouble. <laughs> Everybody's in trouble, dude. So, <laughs> so what does it look like? What does this look like to, to fight against sin? And, and, and most of you are thinking about sins in your own life. You already know what they are. God doesn't. You, you know what they are. You know the things you struggle with. We all have something. We all have things we struggle with. And you know what they are. So what does it look like to fight against them? Well, I just, I just brought some examples. Ones that don't bother me, so I hope they bother you. But one is like if you have a computer that hinders you because of things that are on that computer. You know what that computer is good for? Let me tell you, if it's a laptop, i got a great idea for you. Close it up, unplug everything, take it outside, and see how far you can throw it. Use it as a Frisbee, because that's what it's good for. Jesus is saying it's better to take those things out of your life than let them send you to hell. I'm telling you. I'm, this is what it looks Let's bring it to, the, to today's time. If you got a phone, do you realize our phones today are so smart that some of you would have been better off staying with the flip phones? Because now your iPhones or smartphones have really messed you up. I told a guy the other day, I was in Verizon trying to get a free phone. I'm always trying to get a free phone. And I usually leave mad. <laughs> so uh, I usually leave upset. But um, I was going in there to get a phone, and, and, and they were like, and I was telling them about this phone, and I was like, man, this iPhone 5, 32 gigs, I don't even know what half this stuff means. I'm just trying to present it, you know. And uh, telling them about their, oh, yeah, well, I don't know about this 32 gigs, you know, maybe 16. And I'm like, all I do is call, text, and check email. Anything else doesn't matter to me. I just need a phone. Give me a free phone. That's all I want. But see, the technology now that we've gotten from these phones has been detrimental to some of us. I've watched children, children, children who, and I'm not criticizing, please don't take this critical but I've seen children that have their own smartphones that are not ready to have phones and have full access to the internet don't be that parent don't give your child a cell phone that they're not ready to have and give them full access to the internet and then you don't even check behind what they're doing church now, absolutely what, go, let's go back to what God told Cain. Sin is lying at the door. 
You give them the opportunity to open the door and things will happen. I remember talking, I've talked to parents that those kind of things happen where people were contacting them that shouldn't have been contacting them and sending them pictures that they shouldn't have been sending them. And he's like, I don't know how this happened. I don't know what to do. I got an idea. Take the phone away and then you fix the problem. Church, this is fighting against sin. This is what it looks like. This is going into our, our homes and saying, hey, what are these things that are hindering me? Because whatever they are, I need to step them aside until God matures me to a place that I can handle some of these things. Not sin, because we can't manage sin in our life. I want you to understand something. We don't manage sin. God told Cain, he said, sin wants you and it wants to rule you. And it did, and he went and killed his brother. But we got to understand that if we try to manage sin in our life, it's just going to drive us further and further away from him. Because you can't manage sin in your life. You have to fight against it. There's only one that took all sin, and he hung on a cross, and he died for all sin. For your sin, for my sin, for all our sin. He's the one we take our sin to. If we begin to try to manage it in our own life, we will fail every single time. Romans 6, verse 12. Listen to this. This is Paul. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it. Listen. If it reigns in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 13. Neither yield your members as an instrument of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. As those that are alive from the dead. What he's saying is that you now have the Holy Spirit living in you. He's talking to the believer. He's saying you now have the Holy Spirit living in you. You were dead, but now you are alive. Live. He tells us again, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive. You are now alive. Yield yourself to God and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Listen to this. For sin shall, listen, this is important. This is what I want you to see. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. What is Paul telling us? He's saying that you are no longer under the law of works, being able to make yourself right with God. You are now under grace that Christ has died for you. Ye, he's taken your sin. You look to him for your salvation. You look to him for his forgiveness of your sin. And now that you are in Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit works in you. Guess what? Sin will not have dominion or dominate you. What does that mean? That means that you will struggle with sin, but you shouldn't be living a life of sin. Does that make sense? We will struggle against things. Church, we're not above temptation. We're not above falling. You've watched pastors and preachers and things on, you've read in the news and all these things that preachers that committed these terrible sins. Let me tell you, just because they committed, you better not be careful not to judge and quick to say, oh, they were lost. Be careful. Be careful. Because sometimes we are tempted and we fall and you will fall. But the difference is, it will get back up, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, that sin will not dominate and have dominion over our life because in the power of the Holy Spirit, He will give us the strength to fight against it and overcome it. That's what we are. We are more than conquerors, the Bible tells us, that we are overcomers. We are overcomers in Christ, in the power of the Holy Spirit. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then, verse 15, listen, what then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. God forbid that we should just allow sin in our life unchecked. God forbid that we should just allow things in our life and just say, well, I'm under grace, I'm good, God knows my heart, you know, everything's okay. I'm not perfect. Remember, we go back to that, I'm not perfect, nobody's perfect. So, you know, it's okay. But no, church, it's not. Sin will not have dominion over us. We must be born again. And in new creatures in Christ, we will fight against sin. That's what God was telling Cain. He said, Cain, if you don't obey me, sin is waiting for you. If you reject me and you don't come to me for that, that repentant heart, that repentance, sin is waiting for you. And it will rule you if you let it. It will rule you if you let it. 
So let's fast forward to Hebrews real quick. Fast forward to Hebrews 11.4. Listen to this. This is the author of Hebrews here in verse in chapter 11, verse 4 says this. Listen, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by, and listen, by it he, talking about Abel, being dead, yet speaketh. Listen to this. This is, this is an awesome verse. Let's dissect this for a minute. First, Abel, by, he offered his sacrifice, or his offerings in Genesis calls it, by faith. Okay? And Cain, and and listen what it says, he obtained witness that was righteous. So basically, God looked at him and said, yes, Abel, I accept your offering. I accept your sacrifice. You are made right with me because you came by faith. By faith. See, listen what it goes on to say. God testifying of his gifts. Now, here, Paul, or the author of Hebrews tells us gifts. All right? So maybe Abel brought more than that sheep. Maybe he said, you know what, God? I know what I'm obligated to bring, but you know what? I'm going to bring a little more. I'm going to bring a little more. I need a little more. And, and I'm going to go on to explain to you why. Listen, and God testified, and listen to this, by, and by it, Abel, being dead, yet speaketh. That means that Abel, even though he's gone, He's no longer among us, some of you that didn't know. He still speaks to us today by what he did. Why? Let's compare. Abel gave everything. He gave until it hurt. He gave more than he had to give. His gifts, his offerings, his sacrifice cost him everything. Listen now, listen. He gave in faith that he would need God's mercy. He knew that he needed God's mercy. He gave knowing that sin, knowing his sin and his need of mercy. And I guarantee you, if you ask Abel, was it worth it? I guarantee you, Abel said, I'd have gave it all over again. Why? What was important? Was it, was it, a, was it, a, was it a big deal that his brother killed him? Sure, it was. But... What was more important is that God said, hey, I accept your sacrifice. I accept your offering. You're right with me, Abel. You're good. Me and you are on good terms because of what you gave by faith. The Bible tells us that we are saved by faith. Our faith that Jesus died and rose again for us. He died, took our sin, bore the judgment, the wrath of God on the cross in our place. And for our sin and our forgiveness is in him. If we put our faith in him, we shall be saved. Those that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Cain. Notice Cain is not mentioned in this scripture. Y'all did notice that right? Well, he is, but he's not mentioned in a good way. But Cain gave his offerings out of obligation. Because that's what he was supposed to do. See, he grew up and said, all right. I'm sure maybe Eve came and said, all right, Cain, it's time. you got to make a decision. Get your offering together. And I I could imagine Cain, kind of like some of your kids trying to get him to church. Sunday already, really? I imagine that's Cain's attitude. He got his sacrifice. All right, I'm just going to get what I need because I worked hard on this other stuff. So I'm going to leave this alone. I'm just going to get what I'm supposed to have. Abel said, no, I'm not just going to give the best I got. I'm going to give everything I got. I'm going to give all that I have because I know that I am fallen. I know that, that, that there is sin in my life. I know I need God's mercy. But Cain wasn't worried about these things. He only gave what was expected of him. Church, I'm getting there. Just hold on. I'm about to rock it out here in a minute. Cain was looking unto himself for his acceptance. He went to God with the attitude of, hey, I'm giving you what I'm supposed to give you. Here it is. Almost throwing it in God's face. You say, well, how do you know? Well, let's go back to Genesis real quick. And the Lord said unto Cain, Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I don't know. 
am I my brother's keeper? I almost imagine he's saying, aren't you God? You should know where he is. That's the attitude that was going on here. That's the attitude. Listen, to, am I my brother's keeper? And he says, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries for me from the gown, and now they're cursed. And listen, I want you to hear this. And he said, when thou tillest the ground, it shall be not henceforth unto yield unto her strength. And the, listen to this. And he said, you're going to be a fugitive and a vagabond. Shall thou be in the earth? You're basically cursed. And listen what Cain says. Verse 13. Listen to this. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Not one time did he say, Lord, forgive me. Not one time did he say, Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done to my brother. Not one time did he look and say, Lord, I've committed sin against you and my brother. Not one, he said, I'm worried about what you're punishing me with. He was more concerned about who? Himself. 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 Church, Jude 11, there's only one chapter, so it's verse 11, tells us that people who deny Christ and defile their own uh, de defile their flesh, the Bible tells us in there to beware of them because listen what it says, they have gone in the way of Cain. He says they have gone in the way of Cain. Stay away from these people. And we have, old, we have, we have so many uh, 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 references of the same things that happened. If you remember in the Bible about the Pharisee and the publican, the Pharisee came and said, Lord, I give my tithes. I uh, give my prayers however three times a day. I do this, I do that. He says, thank you that I'm not like this guy over here. And the, and the publicans there beating his chest, the Bible says, wouldn't even look up to heaven and said, Lord, just have mercy on me. Just have mercy on me, a sinner. We also read about it, about the prodigal son who went out. And, and, and you know the story that he went out and, and, and lived in a life of sin, but came back and he knew his need of mercy. He came back to the father and he said, I've sinned against you. He came back for mercy. The father gave him mercy. Who got upset? The brother, the brother who says, hey, hold on, on, I ain't never done nothing wrong. I've stayed here. I've served you like I was supposed to be doing. I've done what was expected of me. I ain't never done nothing wrong. And you went and killed the fattest calf and, and threw him a party. You never did that for me and my friends. Cain was more concerned about his punishment than instead of the repentance that he should have been seeking for sinning against God and his brother. He wasn't worried about him he wasn't worried about God or his brother. So how does this relate to us today? Well, church, I'm going to use some of the, the hot topics. Yeah, the ones y'all like. Our money. When we give our 10% that everybody likes to say, we go to our checkbook and our, our, uh, to see what money we've made in our checks, and we say, okay, let me get my 10% in because that's what I'm supposed to do. Can I tell you, when you're giving your money, out of obligation, you have not done anything for God. You're just giving what you're supposed to do, just like Cain did. You're giving what you're supposed to do. We should be giving until it hurts. That means I'm saying go clean out your bank account and bring it all to the church. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm telling you, church, is if we're, not, if we're just giving out of obligation, we're only doing what we're supposed to do. God doesn't honor that. Because why? The Bible says he likes the cheerful giver. He likes the one that comes and says, hey, you know what, God? You've given me the ability to work. You've given me the breath in my body. You've given me the, the, the knowledge, the strength to do all these things. And in my own worship, by faith, I'm giving back to you what's yours anyway. Because it's yours that you've given me the ability to have. And I'm giving it back to you for your glory to be done, not mine. Not for the American dream, but for the kingdom of God. Church, if we come out of obligation, Pastor Ron, I like the message he preached um, about saying, why are you here? I believe it was two, three weeks ago he preached that sermon about why are you here? That we have to examine our lives and say, what are we doing here? If we're here out of obligation, well, I'm sad to say you're not going to, you're going to leave the same way you came. If you're just here because that's where you're supposed to be. Or you're supposed to do on Sunday because I've heard so many people. I've talked to people all the time. Look, it's so funny when you ask people. When you tell them how you're involved in church and stuff, and then you start asking people, well, do you go to church? Well, I, I was raised in church. Now, I was raised in church. But, you know, I don't really go a whole lot right now. It means I don't go at all. I haven't went in years. But I was raised in church. 
as if that justified them. Because they were raised in church, they're good. Let me tell you, that's not going to please God. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. And, pe- and Abel did it, his offering by faith. He pleased God. If we're not given by faith, we're not pleasing God. Listen, maybe some of you came and said, well, I like the music they play. That's not going to help you. Maybe some say, well, you know, I don't really want to go to hell. So I'll come to church. Not going to get it. Not going to get it. Because if you don't want to go to hell or you're scared to go to hell, well, guess what? If you don't want to serve God, you ain't going to like heaven much either. You're not going to like heaven much either because that's what it's about. It ain't about streets of gold and mansions that everybody on TV wants to tell you about. It's not what heaven's about. It's about Jesus Christ and him crucified, dying on the cross for us, and us going and serving him for eternity. That's heaven. Maybe you came because you say, well, the preaching's not that good, but the kids like it. You better not say that today. I'll be upset. Nah. But we should come with the spirit of saying, Lord, I give you my life. You bought it with the price. I could never repay what you've done for me. And I come to give my service unto you for the kingdom of God because I've been changed. The Holy Spirit is working in me. And when I get around the fellow believers and we encourage one another, I can go back out Monday and begin to fight against the things of this world and the things that would lead me away through the power of the Holy Spirit. And guess what? Not only do I want this, but I want other people to have it too. So I'm going to give my service so we can see the kingdom of God grow for his sake and his glory, not our own. Not for Crosswalk Church, not for Pastor Brandon, not for Pastor Ron, but for the glory of God. I will tell you this, as a young man, and I know people look at me and say, you're still a young man. Well, I will say I agree. But as a young man, (laughs) I will say... And I've said this many times, and I'll still say it right now. There's a lot of times I thought of myself a lot stronger than I really was. And God had to humble me. And he had to chastise me. And it hurt. It hurt bad. But he never left me. And I've learned that as you grow older, some of you may be able to attest to this, that you're like a person Who's been that God has broken into thousands of pieces, and the only reason you're still going is because you're held together by the glue of the Holy Spirit working in your life. That's the only reason some of you are still kicking it. Because let me tell you something, and I ain't talking about living and breathing, I'm talking about still serving the Lord. Because let me tell you, the world gives you every reason to stop serving God and turn away. The world gives you every reason to not press on and follow God. The world and our trials, every, they give us every reason to stop serving God, and you will see many do. There is many in this church have come through, started off good, but through trials or whatever has happened, have turned away and failed to press on. Church, it's dangerous. It's dangerous because we're only going to press on through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're only going to be held together by the power of the Holy Spirit. And listen to this, and this is in closing. And you don't even have to count because this is it. Ready? Hebrews 12, verse 24. Hebrews 12, 24 says this. Listen to this. I want you to get this. This should be on the TV. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh. Listen. Listen. Listen to this, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. Even though Abel, for what he did, cries out to us and tells us, hey, I did it by faith. You go by faith, God will accept you. The Bible says all that will come unto him, he will in no wise cast you out. That if you come to him, he won't cast you out. He says here in this scripture, in this verse, he says, hey, we have a mediator. His name is Jesus that shed his blood. And what he did speaks louder than what Abel could have ever done. And that's where our faith is to look this morning. Father God, I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for your word this morning, Lord. I know, Lord, it was through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that you enlightened me, Lord, to the things of, of, of your word that spoke to us today, Lord. And I ask you right now, Lord, that you just have your way with this time and this service, Lord. I ask you, Lord, to just, just, just. 
clear our minds for that moment, Lord, that we don't, we don't just start thinking about what's next in this service or what's next as we leave, Lord, but we start examining our lives and say, you know what? You know what, God? I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with that. I'm struggling in this area. I'm going through things in this in my life. And I need you.